Oh, thank you so much, uh, all of you, for being here. Ben, thanks so much for, for joining me tonight. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to say uh, this is my first time in this Center for Fiction uh, location, but I have spent a fair bit of time in the Manhattan location before. Um, I was a, a student there in 2010. I took a class with uh, Gordon Lish in the summer of 2010, right after I finished my MFA. That was really important to me, and I wrote part of the first draft of my first novel in the upstairs sort of work area in that Center for Fiction. Um, so it means a lot to me to be back uh, uh, with the Center for Fiction um, and among you all. Uh, and I just want to say a little bit about Refuse to be Done and just sort of where it came from. It's a, a book about how to, to write a novel, how to rewrite a novel, um, really looking at novel writing through the lens of revision and rewriting um, and the kinds of rewriting and revision you do as you go along. And I'll just say that it came first sort of out of my own practice. I finished the first draft of that novel I was writing in 2010, and I got to the end of those like 300 pages, and I thought like, what now? You know, <laughs> sort of a, a rough kind of exploratory first draft. I remember finishing and feeling both proud of myself and kind of melancholy, and I just kind of like sat in my yard and felt sad for like a day um, about like how am I gonna how am I gonna revise this? And so some of the things that are in the book are are really the ways I taught myself to revise novels and, and to rewrite novels. Um, and since then, I've you know been teaching novel writing for the last 10 or 12 years, sort of you know trying to to work with students in the same way. The novel writing classes I teach are, are generative. We start from zero, so everybody in the class starts from nothing, and we write novels together. Um, and so some of what's in the book is sort of coming out of that process. I'm so happy to talk about any of that tonight as it comes up between me and Ben, and then certainly in the Q and A. Um, yeah, and maybe I'll stop talking there and then now talk to Ben a little bit. Hey yeah. Ben, how are you? I'm good, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm good, it's so yes. nice to see you. This is our first time meeting, but we've this also is... been talking forever. Yes, yes. exactly, exactly. Yeah. But no, we're, we're, this is our first time in person and it's, yeah. it's, it's, I've been very excited for as long as we've been uh, scheduled to do this. Yeah. And, and, and this is your first time in New York City in? Yeah, since 2019, for sure, at least, if not maybe maybe 2018. So three or four years, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I've been COVID, looking yeah. forward to this because this is the first time I've actually done an event in public in over two years. Yeah, yeah. So it's nice. It's nice. It's thank nice. you all for being here with us. <laughs> People. <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> so one of the one of the many things that I I, I love about about Refuse to Be Done is that it is. Um, it, in, in a phrase that my fellow uses all the time, it is full of concrete and measurable mm. instructions on how to do things. It is not this sort of like airy, like oh, you know, it just sort of happens up in the cloud. Right. Um, it's like no, this is how you this is how you do it. Yeah. Um, and and as I was looking it over again today, and I was thinking that you know when when the time comes when they finally like let me write a novel. Oh come on! Um, <laughs> it's like I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna keep it right handy. Um, it, the other thing that I I do really appreciate appreciate about it is that it is so full of positive thought. There is no scolding. There is no finger wagging. Oh. Um, and I would imagine that as a teacher, that's something that you've perfected over the years. Oh, perfected? I don't know. <laughs> I, do think I, I do think I'm a reasonably positive uh, instructor in that way. Um, you know, I, uh, I was a like, serial college dropout. I you know, finished college at 26 in my third university, and I, I mostly spent uh, like 10, year, 10 years post high school managing restaurants and bartending and different things. And one of the things that I t think I told myself to make myself uh, feel okay about being a serial college dropout was that like everybody has a job and everybody's trying to do the best they can and like you're, there's no like better or worse we're just doing this together and I feel very similarly about like people who are writing we're all writing like there's no like just you know at some point you've written a couple books you've written a couple books you write books but like you're every time you do it it's kind of for the first time uh, I can't remember who said it but there's like sort of a like the novel you're writing doesn't know about the novels you've written, <laughs> you know, um, which feels very true. They are always sort of in it for the first time. Um, and I, I do think there's like a, I have a craftsman like approach to writing where like I do want to know like the practical things you can do to go forward um, because those are the most useful. Uh, one of the things the book tries to do is to break, especially like late stage revision into like things you can do and feel like you accomplish something. Like if you go through and you edit all the dialogue in the book, like that's a thing. At one point you've done it. 
you know, or you go through and edit all the chapter openings or something. And that way of making, uh, making a novel good into like tasks, as opposed to the, uh, the huge job of that, which seems impossible, uh, mostly, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, one of the, one of the things that I, I I think is surprising, or at least it's surprising to me, is your idea that the the novel, as you first write it, that you're not an outliner. Mm. Yeah. So I, I uh, yes, not. <laughs> so I don't outline first drafts. I I think I think if I had to outline the first draft, I might never start, which is maybe part of it. The idea of like figuring out the whole book before I begin. You can begin from very very little. I think. Um, and so for me, I think of a first draft as like an exploratory draft. Like I'm trying to sort of discover the book by writing the book. And that has only gotten more true in time. I think I know, I always have an idea of what I'm writing. I'm trying to get to certain places or maybe I have an idea of the ending or I have some things I want to write about. But I'm really figuring out the book as I, I, as I go. Um, and I see that in my students' work as well, that even when they start with an outline, the outline ends up not being the book. Um, one of the things I, I pay a lot of attention to in students' work that I see in my own is there'll be all this like kind of exposition that is you discovering backstory, you discovering world building or different things. And um, uh, st students will write like first chapters or I'll write first chapters where there are like four moves to backstory in the first chapter of the book, right? And they'll like a character will say something and then it will tunnel backwards for four pages. And we kind of know that's not what a final first chapter can or should look like. Um, but I know what they're doing there is like discovering the characters and discovering the book. And I've, I've gotten better at allowing myself to do that. Uh, a thing in the draft I'm writing now that I've been really excited about is I'll write like 10 pages of world building exposition where I'm trying to figure out an historical event in a world I've invented kind of thing. And then a character in a later scene will just mention it. Like they just know about it already. I'm like, oh, I can go back and cross out those 10 pages, <laughs> you know? Um, because I can feel myself like just the, I'm building the scaffolding around the book, and then the book somehow exists inside that. Um, so I, don't, I find that really exciting. I actually find it really freeing that you need to know almost nothing to start a novel if you want to. Yeah. Um, which is nothing against people who outline everything in advance. That's fine. There's just different ways of doing things. But you don't need to know very much to start. And then your, your, your next step, as I recall, is that once you have finished the first draft and you are getting ready to, to head into the next draft, that's when you retro outline your manuscript. Right. <laughs> so for me, this was, I think, the big discovery after that first novel draft of, of my novel in the house upon the dirt between the lake and the woods, um, is I, I wrote the draft in this very exploratory, just figuring out as I went fashion. And I was like, well, how do I make this into like a good book? And uh, what I landed on, and I think it was I saw Victor Laval in an interview talking about um, writing these like beat sheets of his own novels and just writing down like just the events that happen in the book. And I think that was the that was what suggested it to me. But I made what I think of now as like a narrative outline where I just try to describe the action of the of the book, not the backstory, not the digressions, not the interiority, but just the events that like unfold through time in the book. And once I have that done on paper, then I revise the outline into a plan for the second draft. And that's worked really well for me. Uh, I, I mean, I've published three books doing it, so it's worked well three times. Um, hopefully it's working with the book I'm writing now, um, but to be determined. Um, but for me, that's been a nice way to go from like the just discover your material in a very organic kind of way to a like planned, plotted, like as tight as you can possibly make it draft. Um, yeah, and I think that was very much a like discovered through my own needs and then became something that hopefully is, is teachable or useful to other people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, it was, I didn't know how to get to that next draft without doing that. Yeah, and then, and then you, you also talk about, and, and, and I think that this is a, uh, uh, I think this is a great thing that the the, the, the idea is uh, to 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 rewrite the book to to retype the book. Yeah. You know, it's not cutting and pasting. It's not just sort of like tweaking and playing. It's like do it again. Get it out of your fingers again. Yes. <laughs> so the the thing I do once I have this outline, thank you, Ben, is um, I uh, like giving away. Is, no, is no, this is like, great. This, this is a trick. Spoilery? No spoilers. Let's let's have spoilers. It's good. <laughs> Um, my, my editor, Mark Dunn, was the editor of this book, 
told me a long time ago, I complained about spoilers in a, in a review of my first novel. He was like, oh, like spoilers are a, a, a bougie concern. And I was like, I don't know what that means. But every time I think they complain about it, I'm like, oh, that's like a bougie thing to worry about. So I no longer worry about it. I'm <laughs> and I remind myself once again that I'm extraordinarily bougie. Yeah, me too. Right? Yeah. Like, I don't know what that means, but I feel like I'm avoiding it because of that. No. Um, so I, I retype my second drafts uh, from like an empty document, and I rewrite them toward this outline I've written. Um, uh, there's a quote in Refuse to Be Done that would be better than I'm going to say it now from Amy Tan, where she talks about the second draft being written in the knowledge of all that's happened. And so like the first draft is you discover what happens in the book, and the second draft you write from that knowledge. And I think that's the sort of ideal for me, is that I'm, I, I sort of understand the story, understand the plot better, now I can write like the best possible version of, of what happens. Um, and I do retype mostly from scratch. Uh, from that first novel, I've had like two monitors at home, and I will put the old draft on the second monitor and like an empty draft on the first one. And I call the old draft the diminishing draft. And as I, as I use things from it, I delete them. So like the idea is like one day the diminishing draft will be like zero, and the second draft will be full, and you've done some kind of life force transfer to your own book. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't let myself copy and paste. I think uh, that's not rewriting. Uh, if you're rewriting things, you're making it again, you're retyping it, you won't retype your own bad sentences, I think. You won't be able to. You'll be like, oh God, this is like a miserable scene. Why am I typing it again? Um, but you will copy and paste your own bad prose round. Um, as I do too, and, I, and even if I'm saying this, I get lazy about it all the time, and I see in the, I'm like, that's a pretty good scene in the first draft, I'll just copy it in, and I inevitably end up throwing it out and doing it again, because it's just not as good as the, as the second draft material. Um, and I think I've, I've learned a lot of other writers do this in different forms. You know, I, I had Lauren Groff into a class of mine a couple of years ago talking about her novel Arcadia, which I think is one of the, like, the mechanically perfect novels. that does not feel like a machine when you're reading it. Like, when you take it apart, you're like, nothing is out of place in that book. Um, and she talked about like writing a draft by hand, putting a drawer, never looking at it again, and then writing like now I can focus on the sentences because I know what happens. And I think that's like the ideal there in some ways is that um, divorcing like the version of the book a reader will see from the version of it you need to write to to sort of get it. Yeah. You 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 said that I I think you said that that you wrote your first novel and it never saw light of day. Yeah, I have two novels that I never showed anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wrote one, like a Nano Remo novel in like 2006, that was like a, a Chuck Palahniuk fan fiction, I think. I'm like, right? Yeah. <laughs> like a pretty good Chuck Palahniuk novel, you know? Um, and uh, and uh, then I wrote a, uh, maybe right before I went to grad school, I wrote like a 400 page novelization of the Neutral Milk Hotel album in the Aeroplane Over the Sea. Nice. Um, <laughs> Which also, well, I was in a writing group, so people saw some of it as I was writing it, but no one ever read the whole thing. And I think both of those were pretty quickly drawered. Like, I didn't, I didn't know how to revise them, and I also didn't really think that I should or needed to. They, they didn't feel like they were going to be first books. So that doesn't haunt you? No, not those books. Yeah, other books I failed to finish out me, but not those two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you talk about, and I know that this is something that uh, at least every writer I've ever known is obsessed with, uh, the pace of writing, mm. word count, daily, yeah. you know, wh how, how much time you're putting, how much time you're putting in and when you're putting it in. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we all, I mean, I'm trying to strike like my productivity language for myself a little bit. Like I'm not a factory, like I don't want to be a factory when I'm writing. Um, but the truth is, if you write like 500 words a day, five days a week, you'll write 130,000 words in a year. So like, to, you can write a novel every year by writing that, I mean, I don't write a novel every year, but like in theory, by writing that much, you could get a novel amount of words every year. Um, I think for me, the, day, the, the practice of being a regular writer has more to do with how it makes me feel than how it gets books done. Um, days where I write seriously or days where I read seriously, I feel more like myself than I do on days I don't. Um, if I go a couple of days without writing or reading, I start feeling very like thin, 
like kind of as a person. Um, and maybe you're like a super healthy person who feels like a person all the time. And you don't need reading and writing that much. And we're going to say kudos. That seems neat. Um, <laughs> but I think like a certain amount of art coming in, a certain amount of art coming out makes me feel like a, a person. So it certainly gets the books done, but it's mostly um, um, trying to do that. I do think it does seem hard. I can, I, I can only talk about my own practice, but I feel like it would be hard for me to do the work of novel writing if I wasn't touching it reasonably regularly. Sure. And it seems like it would just be hard to like manage that much material at once. Um, but yeah, there's, there's some of it's like, I, I do want to get books done a certain way, but mostly it's really about how like the daily practice of writing makes me feel as a person, um, which is better than the alternative. Yeah, I mean, now do you, do you have do you have like do you have rituals? It's like this time to that time. Yeah. Eating does occur. It doesn't occur. Sure. No, eating occurs. Like you can't write without eating constantly. Um, <laughs> I, I ideally I write in the mornings. I used to be a late at night writer when I was younger. Um, ideally I write from like breakfast to lunch a couple, you know, four or five days a week. Um, and I've been lucky, of course, to have the kind of life where I mostly do that. I, when I was an editor, I, I did my editing work after I was done writing. And as a teacher, I've been lucky to teach mostly afternoon and evening classes. So I've, I've been able to sort of protect that part of me. But I'm just fresher in the morning. I, like, I feel more open in the morning. I mean, and the thing is, you and I both have day jobs right. that are yeah. deeply involved with sure. writing, with yeah. other people's yeah. writing. Um, I, I found when I finally was you know, getting the rhythm to, you know, to, to work on my own book, it's like that on days when that we're going to be writing days and and and, right. and random house days it was like no the writing has to come first yes. it's like coffee write right be done with it yeah and then do work because at the end of the day i got nothing left. no god nothing no, yeah the idea of working on my own stuff after editing somebody else's or after teaching is impossible like yeah. I, there's no way um when i wrote my first novel i was uh, i was working from home and I, uh, my wife was a PhD student in, in chemistry, so she was gone like 16 hours a day at the lab. And I, I lived like this very Spartan, like weird life where I was like waking up and I'd make a cup of coffee and I'd write, and I would eat like two hard boiled eggs, like out of those like bags of hard boiled eggs you buy. You're not even like making hard boiled <laughs> eggs. And then I would like go back and work my novel until like one in the afternoon, then I would switch to my other job. And uh, the idea of doing that again seems not great. <laughs> yeah. But there was this, like, I had a, like, a really small, I made the rest of my life small so I could think around it, right? Um, but yeah, I think I, I have to do it before I answer email. I have to do it before I, certainly before I do teaching prep or working on students' stories or other people's stuff. Um, yeah, I think my world, and, and it also makes me like better in those spaces. Like when you go to work, you're not, wishing you were working on your own thing. Like I did right. my thing and now I can be present there. I think it makes me a more present person to write before I do those things. Yeah. 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 Um, but, you know, beyond just sort of like, you know, putting in the work, getting the outline done. I mean, one of the things that I do appreciate as you as you narrate a writing process is how much detailed work that you you do lay out that you yeah. do lay out in the book. I mean, you are doing the sort of work that's not all that foreign to me right. uh, as, as a copy you know as a copy yeah. editor look at, looking for repetitions. I mean, you 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 lay out a wonderful list of what you refer to as your. Uh, your particular focus of weasel words. Yeah, yeah. You know, and the ones that you go searching for in yeah. the manuscript uh, to dispose of. But I mean, you know, so it, I, I just think that the thing that's really important is that it is real, practical, detailed mm -hmm. technique. Yeah. You know, it's not just like, oh, it's a novel, it happened. <laughs> You know, it's like I sat down and the next thing I knew there were 100,000 words on the page. Right. It's that easy. I mean, kind of. But <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the, the things that was helpful to me as a teacher is I think I, the kind of novels I write are fairly like weird and idiosyncratic. And it was never, it never felt like my goal should be like to make other writers write like me, right? Like the idea that like the way I do things is the way other people should do them seems in some ways kind of crazy, even though we're talking about a book that I wrote about how to write. Um, so what I was looking for are the things that benefit like everyone or that are sort of universally beneficial. Um, ben just mentioned this thing called Weasel Words, um, which is just this list of like uh, words that let you sometimes write a functional sentence that's not a very good sentence. They're like little like kind of linguistic crutches. Um, and, I, and I go through at late, late in the process, I'll go through and I'll just search for them 
Um, one of mine, and I think like you uh, have occasionally been on Twitter, been like, people shouldn't worry about this word as much as maybe like a Matt Bell worries about it. So like you can give the counter argument. But like one of, <laughs> one of the words I, I know I overuse, or, or at least you can get rid of sometimes, is the word like that, right? Which like uh, it, it, it has its function and it does things, but often it's like a, in a sentence where it kind of isn't doing a lot, or you can take it out and the sentence is fine without it. So um, it's one of the words I look for, and I have this kind of whole list in the book. Uh, but in my second novel, Scrapper, when I was finishing that, I at some point did a search, and I just took all of the that's in the book out with like track changes out. And then I went through and I was like, does this sentence need it? Or can I write it a different way so it doesn't need it? And I took 900 that's out of Scrapper, really, really late in the process. And if you're writing in Times New Roman and double space, 12 point font, uh, like 250 words go on a page. So there's like three and a half pages of the word that that like came out of the book, and then the reader no longer had to read. I think if they were there, no one would notice them. But them not being there means the book is faster, right? It has like it has a little it prose is like that much better. And some of that stuff is like it's like a trick, right? You find yeah. like the little ways where like the prose that's the part where the book for me always starts feeling like, oh now it reads like a book that's on the shelf which happens for me at like 98% done of the process. And copy editing, it always feels even more that after that. Because there is that just sort of like, we'll get rid of some of the extraneous stuff. We'll, we'll make everything a little cleaner. We'll teach the novelist how to punctuate again, even though he's published a bunch of books. Yeah, like, I mean, I, 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 I have a very complicated relationship with the word that, because I think that it's often very useful. I think, yep. that, I think that sometimes people mistake the notion that editing means cutting. Um, yes. and, and, and often I find as a, as, a, as a copy editor that sentences are actually improved by putting a few more words yeah, into yeah, them. It's yeah. like, it needs some air, it needs a little yeah, breathing space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and, 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 and well, I, can, I can talk about it now, I can right. talk about it today, uh, because we finally announced the cover reveal that Elizabeth Stroud has a new novel coming right. out uh, called Lucy by the Sea. It's very, very good. If you are, if you are a Lucy Barton, O. William, Anything is possible, fan. You will find this absolutely essential. Yeah. Uh, but I just, I just did the, I just right. did the copy edit, and this is our sixth ah, book. That's so good. Together, and, and and it's wonderful because it's this, it's this experience of like she and I sh get to share space. We get to share mental space, yeah. um, and it's it's a it's a just it's a great adventure for me. But like particularly to the word that. It's like, I put them in, I take them out, I put them in, it's like, all right, I really want one here, so I'm gonna see if I can find one to yank somewhere oh, right. else. You know, it has, you know, have to be fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to be, you have to be fair about these things. But um, suddenly is a very dangerous yeah, word. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, then is a very dangerous yeah. word, and then is and a then. very dangerous and word. And then's a crutch of mine, which yes. I think is a replacement for like something else, right? You get rid of all your finalies, and then you put in like at last or something, yes. right? You do all these like, you have your replacement addictions, you know, you stop smoking, but eat a lot of candy. Like, just, these are the, there's the linguistic versions of those, right? Yeah, and then, yeah. And then of course, nodding. Nodding, yeah. Nod, nodding, is, nodding is very tricky. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think actually one of the things I, I mean, this, this is that breaking it down to tasks, like where you look for like, uh, for me, like the nods, the smiles, the shrudges, the, you know, the sort of things in the book, and then finding like just ways to put something more interesting in there is uh, that's the thing you can do all the way through the book and feel like you did something, right? Like I dealt with my dialogue adjacent actions, um, which actually feels like a really wonderful process. I don't think this is in the, I don't think it's in the book. I think it's something I figured out writing my last book, but I always keep this cut file of everything I've thrown away. And the cut file is great for replacing these like weak actions. There's all these little gestures you wrote and scenes you threw away that I go and like mine for those things. So it's like, oh, this is good. That's like a place that's actually useful to have 100,000 words I threw away in this novel. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting to sort of get into that sort of uh, level of editing. And I feel like that's the part where it um, snaps up. I feel like one thing that's really, that makes my students anxious and maybe makes some of the writers here anxious as well is the way that you're your book doesn't read like a book most of the time. Like it sort of doesn't look like books that are on the shelf in any way. Um, and some of this is like just the ways you move toward that and you realize how late in the process that kind of snap toward it can happen. Um, I don't know if that was the case with, with Dreyer's English. It happens in nonfiction too, right? There's still a place where like, it's, it's like a mass of stuff that's pretty good and then it like sucks toward being like, oh yeah, that's a book, it's ready yeah. to go. It's, yeah. it's ready for race time, you know, or like whatever the metaphor is. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, you know, for me, I mean, because, you know, I have been, I've, I've been doing this for so long, I mean, working in publishing yeah. for so long. It's like, I mean, I was writing the book 
and, and, and I will confess, I was writing the book and already like trying to figure out what it was going to look like on the page. Right. Absolutely. You know, I can like, feel that in the book. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. you know, it's yeah. like the space breaks, the, uh -huh. the subheads. It's like yeah. a little intense. Yeah. Um, but it's the only way I can look at books. Right. You know, it's like because I know books. Yeah. But my drafts look like that too. I think like from the first day, the first day I'm working on a novel, it has a title page, and it has like I and I may do that thing where you put the chapter heading like two thirds of the way down the page or halfway down the page. So it kind of looks the way it will in a book. But I think part of that for me is like convincing myself that I'm writing a book. Yes. Right, you know, that there's this sort of like, um, if it looks like a book early, you can pretend it's a book. It has a title, it has a title page, it has an epigraph, it has chapter headings. And you're like, well, this must be a book. I just haven't written all of it. Yeah. Um, it's this confidence tricks <laughs> in every direction until you're done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I looked at your book a lot when I was writing my book, this one, because I, I admired yours so much. And one of the things I really liked about yours was the way that you allowed it, uh, which I think is not always the case in, in a nonfiction or, or a instructional text in some way, to be like different in different places. Or so sort of like, this is the mode of this part, or this part will be a numbered list, and this part will be subheadings. And I feel like your book has a, a real organicness to it that feels rare in that space. Yeah, I think it's part of the pleasure. I mean, and you know, and this is the thing. I mean, I mean, it's like I, 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 I say it a lot, and 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 I've heard other writers saying. I just said other writers. It's like it's still a little weird for yeah. me to like. You know, it's like you're a writer. Then yeah, I'm yeah, a writer, yeah. as opposed to copy editor. Yes. Uh, I have heard other writers say this as well. It's like, I can only write the way I can write, <laughs> yeah. and it only goes well when I let myself. Yeah. Do that. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it's probably that simple, really, right? Like, write the way you write and don't let people throw you off of that. You know, it's so easy. Um, I mean, I don't know for you, but I think for me, writer's block is like mostly comparison, right? Like, it's like you, you wish, like, I wish my book looked like these other books, or I wish I wrote the way other people seem to write. And of course, because you don't have real access to other people's process, you don't see the mess of theirs. Um, I remember this was in like an article in like Slate like 10 years ago about like why the internet is making us miserable. Remember how, how much less miserable it made us 10 years ago and now it makes us like real miserable? Um, <laughs> uh, but it was saying like the problem isn't that you want to be as happy as other people, it's that you want to be as happy as other people appear to be. And uh, which is like, a, it was a quote from like a French philosopher whose name I do not remember. I'm paraphrasing badly. But there's a writing process version of that too. It's not that you want to write as easily as other people really write. So you want to write how it seems like they write. Um, because everybody's process looks easier than how yours feels. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so hopefully this book is also like, this is really the stuff I do. And like, you know, for better or worse, this is how my books get written. Um, some of which you'll probably see or read and be like, that seems like a terrible way to spend your time. <laughs> but, uh, but it is uh, trying to be as honest about that as possible. I think it doesn't benefit us to pretend that it's like magic, that these things just sort of happen. Or that, you know, um, It doesn't for me anyway, like most of it is. Uh, yeah, tricky sort of work that you make yourself do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, all right. So not not necessarily with this book because sure. this is this is you know this yeah, is yeah. a this is a unique object. But with your novels, mm. um, how does how, how does it go between you and your copy editor? Oh, so I love every copy editor I've worked with. Um, this is my my fourth book at Soho. I did have a different copy editor for this book. For the three books of fiction I did with them, the first copy editor, my first novel, I liked so much that when we did the contracts for like the second and third book, I was like, I will do this book with you if I can you like guarantee that you will hire the same freelance copy editor again. Great. I loved her so much. Um, and she was really, uh, and, and just really like got what I was doing and, and, and felt like she made the book better in every way. Um, if you haven't published a book before, one of the most delightful things that happens when you publish a book is your copy editor makes what's called a style sheet in which, um, and you would be able to say this better than me probably, but one of the things they do is they make a list of all the words you've made up. That's exciting. It turns out like a bunch of the stuff in my books aren't words already. Um, that's always nice to find out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sort of a list of like grammatical rules that you're bending in some way or you're doing kind of your own thing with. Um, and 90% of that every time is like something I tried to do and 10% is like, nope, I just don't understand how that works. And so let's correct all of those. Um, and, uh, and they also make like a chronology of your book. There's like uh, uh, my, my copywriter for my novel, Apathy, that, that came out last year. It was this like, it was so extraordinarily detailed about the, all the events in the book and I was like, 
to start with this, right? It was like, it was like this amazing, uh, uh, a better outline in my book than I ever had for it. Um, and then I, I really, I think I've learned to trust my copy editors a lot. Like, I mean, I really take 98% of things. Um, uh, actually, with this last novel, um, because I can sometimes feel combative toward edits, uh, when I opened it up, I looked at all the copy edits, looked at it very quickly, and then I just hit accept all and took all of them. <laughs> and then I read through the book again. Yeah. And like, if something seems off, I'll notice. But I should just believe first. Because some things like, I think a lot of novelist punctuation is really acoustic, but not grammatical. You're putting commas where you hear them, as opposed to where they go in the sentences. But the reader needs them to kind of go where they're supposed to go. And they won't, they'll hear the book fine. It won't be exactly the way you hear it, and it'll be OK. But I, yeah, I just accepted everything. And then I handled the comments. And, uh, and I think that was probably a healthier way to be than like every comma being like, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know like, yeah. um, and I, you know, there were maybe 10 times in the whole manuscript where I was like, well, maybe I should go look at the original for this. Something seems a little off here. Um, you know, you're lucky to have people working on your books. You should trust them to do the part of the process they do well. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a great thing, and I'm so pleased to hear yeah. that it's worked out for you yeah. in this way. I mean, with, with us, uh, you know, it's like we have a lot of authors who do right. repeat you know, with yeah. us, and, and, we, and we have what I, they, they, they do tend to be women, and I do tend to refer to them as the once a year gals. Yeah. Um, it's, like, it's like the third Tuesday in March is her on sale date. Yeah. And, every, and it's like, that's not moving. Right. Um, but when, when I, when as the managing editor, I introduce one of my production editors to, it's like, this is your new author. Right. And it's like, if it works, it's like, well, then we just keep that going, yeah, book after absolutely. book after book. And, and my production editors, of course, all have their like, little army of freelance copy editors. Yeah. And it's like, and if the copy editor and the author yep. you know, click, it's like, then you preserve that yeah. for as long as you possibly can. Yeah. Um, because one thing that's really, one thing that's really good, and it's good for authors, and it's, and it's, and it's good for copy editors too, to know that you are there because you are wanted right. there, yep. so that you are not, when you're trying to do your copy editorial work, constantly looking over your own shoulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, he's gonna hate when I say that. Mm -hmm. It's like, then he'll say no. Right. You yeah. Know? Yeah, I think that feels absolutely right. When I was a, a book editor, I got to work with a couple editor authors at the same time. You just build in your previous relationship, and you know, uh, Mark Donut so and has edited four books of mine. And, you know, you like you don't have to discuss everything from scratch again, right? And it does save some of that sort of time. Um, and of course, you probably do write a little bit with their voices in your head a little bit, right? You're sort of like, oh, look, Mark would be like, no. <laughs> and maybe I'll do no now. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I feel really lucky to be edited. I, when I worked as an editor just one time, I had an author, who a book I did not acquire, but I had been tasked to edit. I sent them edits, and they wrote me back, uh, which I worked really hard on. And they sent me back an, an email that just said no. And I wrote my boss, and I was like, "Don't ever have that person contact me again." Like, yeah. right? Like, I was like, "Cool, like that's that." But like, I, I mean, I've never felt that way. I've been so grateful for for my editors. I'm so grateful for my teachers, and so any anybody who wants to make your book better, who genuinely wants to make your book better, is so useful. I do think, you know, I think a lot about a, a Neil Gaiman quote where he talks about like. Uh, if five people tell you something is wrong with your story, that's pro there's probably something wrong with it. But like anyone who tells you exactly what was wrong with it is probably wrong too. And there is some some mix of that, right? Where like if there's something wrong with your story, and everybody sees it, but maybe you have to find your own solution to it. That seems important. But um, but it does seem like you should take the advice of the people who you've be decided to be in partnership with on your book, right? Uh, that seems really useful to me. I've also never had an editor complain that I, maybe they just complained to someone else, they never complained to me about where like something's not working and I've solved it in my own way. I think that's, I, when I was an editor, I wanted people to edit on top of my edits. I didn't want them to accept or reject. I wanted them to use them as a springboard to the next best version of the book. And that seems useful. Yeah. Maybe you're just like, just put the commas where I told you. Well, no? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you know, the thing is, it's like, um, 
you know, th there's a huge difference between the kind of work that I do as a copy editor and the kind of work sure. that the people that, you know, that I always refer to as the editor editors yeah, yeah. do. And I, I remember once I was, I, I, I was walking down the hall back when there was a hall to, you know, to walk down when yeah. I was in an office. And, and, and I would always take any excuse I could find to go into Susan Campbell's office, who was our, our late uh, publisher and editor-in-chief uh, at Random House. Um, just because I just wanted to know what Susan had to say on, right. any, on any particular given day. And, and, I, and I wandered into her office one day, and, and she just started talking about a novel that she was trying to edit. And I wish I had recorded everything that she had said, because what she told me about the problems she was facing and the way she was trying to solve them was so magical mm -hmm. to me. It was so not the way my brain right. operates. Yeah. It's like, I'm, I'm a paragraph boy. Right. <laughs> You know, that's a good T-shirt, by the way. A paragraph yes, boy. I'm a paragraph boy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I I don't do arcs. Right. You know, she does. She did. Yeah. And it was just, it was amazing to listen to what an editor's work yeah. is. Yeah. I I, I I I take it this magic occurs between you and your editor. I think so. Yeah. It feels really delightful. I I know there's a part in in Appleseed, one of the storylines, where my editor Catherine Ninsel at, at uh, uh, Harper Collins, um, she her her interest in it lit it up for me. You know what I mean? Like she, she just like this one thread in the book that she was more interested in some ways than I was that like brought it to the fore for me. And I just like it was so great to get to follow her her interest or her vision inside my own book. You know, it wasn't in no way taking something from me. It was like showing me the potential in something I was trying to make. That feels so magical when that's the case. Um, I, I don't think I've ever had an editor who was like trying to make my book into something it wasn't. That's just never happened. Like I, I mean, I assume that happens somewhere because we hear stories about it. Yes, we do. Yes, but they have not been my experiences. So I have like two things I'm trying, I want to badger you about before we. Sure. I know people want to get to ask questions. One of them is I'm, I'm super curious what like your own copy editing experience was like. As, a, as the person who is the copier chief, who didn't even get to do it in some ways when you're already the boss. And then, yeah, tell me about that. What, was, right, what so, was it like so, being copy edited specifically? So after, after we got through the, the editorial process, which was, which was pretty easy, yeah. all things taken into account, yeah. it was kind of like, could you, could you, could you die, tur turn it down a little bit, <laughs> please? Um, you know, it's like, thank you, Liberace, dial it down. Um, when it came time to put the thing into copy editing, the, 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 the person in my department, my production yeah. editor, literally my right-hand guy. Right. I mean, he's in the office right. to my right. Yeah. He is my senior production editor. I asked him if he would be the production editor right. for my book. And, and at that point, I was pretty much ready to sort of back off because yeah. the last thing anybody needs is somebody breathing down their neck all the time. But I did say, could you please get Bonnie Thompson to, to, to copy edit my book? Because when I had been a production editor, she was one of my pet copy editors. Yeah. And, she, and, 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 and she, was, she, 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 was, she was great. She listens really well. She has a good sense of humor. Her style sheets were just things of mm. beauty. Um, uh, any author who ever worked with her would always ask to have her back. Yeah. And so I said, can I, can, can I, can I have Bonnie? And, and so Dennis got Bonnie to do it. And then I, 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 before I withdrew from the process and let her do her job, I said, look, I said, I don't want to be rubber stamped. Right. You know, it's like, you I want really you to do, it. do yeah, yeah, for yeah. me what you've been doing for all the people I've hired you to do. And she was, she was, she was spectacular. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm certainly aware of some of my bad habits. She was more than happy to point out uh -huh. the rest of them. <laughs> um, she was very good at like sharpening jokes. Yeah. Oh, um, and great. one of the things that she did that I really appreciated is, and, and it's something that I will do as a copy, as a copy editor, it's like, if you really want something to be different than what it is on the page, and you feel safe doing it, you don't just ask an open-ended question, you provide the variation right. so that the author can say, this is great, yep. yes. Yes. Absolutely. Because if you ask an author an open-ended question, the answer is very likely to be, it's fine the way it is, leave it alone. Yeah. yeah. Um, but she 
imitates me. She imitated yeah. me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and it made, me, it made me laugh, and I would just pick up stuff that she had done mm -hmm. and stick it right in the manuscript. Yeah. So it, it, it went really well, and, and it was the right proportion. I mean, I always think that a, a, a good, pro I mean, you, you obviously have great faith in, in, in your copy editor. I think that a, a, a good proportion of accepting of copy editing is anything between 75 and 90%. Yeah. Any more than that, it's like the author's not invested. Right. Yeah. No. Whenever and someone sit back and edit, they're just like accept all. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta say no. Accept all is as bad as accept nothing. Yes. Like those are the two. Like don't do either of those two things. Yes. I think. Yeah. But um, her her work was just superb. Uh, just great. superb. Really, really, really improved. Did you have a Did you have a thing in your style sheet that was a grammar rule you didn't know you did wrong? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> That's the nice part about being a genius. I don't have that. Uh, I don't have that luxury. I have tons of things I don't know I'm doing wrong. <laughs> Love it. Uh, are we at the? We're at the point where we should take some audience questions. Uh, glad to talk to you about anything you'd like about novel writing, writing in general, anything me or Ben could talk to you about. Thank you all so much. Um, and if you have a question, you can go right up to the microphone with Destiny and just say your question right into the microphone, so that, so that our friends on Zoom can also hear it. Yeah. Thank you so much for this uh, conversation. I had a question about, um, so, I, so I'm working on a novel, and I feel like I go through periods of extreme megalomania, where I feel like I'm like, the best sure. writer ever, and then like extreme moments of doubt, where I'm like, this is crap, I should just give up. Can you talk a little bit about what keeps you going or grounded throughout a whole novel process? Yeah, thank you. That does seem the path, right? Um, I think, uh, so when I was writing my, my first novel, the first draft uh, it took me like a year or something, right? And there was a point like five or six months in where I was a little like bored, a little lost. I sort of didn't know what I was doing. And I remember still like just kind of going to the desk and doing my work. And I, I thought like later I'm going to come back and I'm going to be able to really see this like months writing where I just like went through the motions, but I was not really into it. I wasn't super invested or I thought I was writing a bad book. And when I got done and I reread the draft, I was like, oh, it's all about the same. Like it didn't like the, the parts where I felt really excited are not really better than the parts where I felt really down. You know, it's just sort of a similar thing. And uh, it made me think of when I was bartending, and I would, you know, sometimes on a Friday night, you go in, you're in a good mood, and everybody was having a lot of fun, and the customers were cool, and you'd make a hundred bucks. And the next night, you'd be like hungover, and the customers were rude, and your colleagues were making you mad, and you'd make a hundred bucks. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, like if you're doing the work, you're doing the work. And you just sort of stay in it as you go, and that, and that can be part of it. So I think there is a like, just keeping at it as part of, you, know, you have to write through the bad parts, I guess, is maybe the, long, the short story of that. Um, confidence is a funny thing. I mean, it's, it really feels like one of the major skills of being a novelist is like being able to push through long periods of uncertainty. Because it's like, will it come out? Will it matter? Will it, will it be good? Um, I don't think there's an easy way to do that, um, but I, I do think that if you trust in your sort of process, like you, the same process that you do when you're feeling like a megalomaniac, do that when you feel like a fraud, and it will be okay. Like, is, is this like, this is another craft book, like write like a megalomaniac, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but like, <laughs> but I, I do think that's sort of part of it. What about you, Ben, when you're like feeling like, I don't know what I'm doing, this is a mistake? I, I mean, it was hard. It was hard yeah, for me. Yeah, it's hard to write about. It was hard for me. I, I, I spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of time writing tens of thousands of words yeah. that were boring. Yeah. And awful. Yeah. And I threw them out. Yeah. And and it took me a really long time to to figure out how I was supposed to be writing and right. to, and and to find my voice. And and there was the day that I, I I I did. I went into my editor's office. Now, mind you, my editor is upstairs. <laughs> You know, and it's like as 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 managing editor, I can barge into any editor's office that I want whenever I want. But to go to him when I want to whine, I have to call him and say, "May your author come upstairs and talk to you." Yeah. yeah. And I went upstairs, and 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 I said, "If I can't lick this, I said, please let me out of my contract." Uh -huh. And he laughed in my face, uh -huh. and he said, "You're so close," and and he said, "Just just." Come back, you know, in a, in a couple of weeks, and I and I I went back and I went to work, and and he said all of the right sort of petting and patting things, and I went and I did it and I handed him the next installment of pages, and he's like, you nailed it, right? 
And it's like, but from that point on, and I'm not saying that it was like, then it just became the magical process, <laughs> but it was like, at that point on, I was sort of held aloft by the fact that he had told me that I knew what I was doing. Yeah. So the rest of the process just sort of, as much time as I could put in, was productive writing yeah. every day. And I was so grateful for that. So I think there has to be some sort of weird combination of knowing from the inside that you know what you're doing, but also it really helps to have somebody from the outside yeah, tell you that I you know that's what right. you're doing. I'll, I'll add one, one thing really quickly and just say, like, I often feel that way when a turn in my conception of the book is happening. And so like, you, you set out to write one kind of book, and it has to, like, the structure has to become something else, or the story wants to go in a different direction. And there's like, a part where, like, until I accept the new version of the book, I feel like I'm failing. And like, but it's just because the book's changing. Um, I always think of this through like Richard Hugo's essay, The Triggering Town, about poetry. I think I heard someone say yes in the audience. It's great. Um, and Hugo just says like, there's a triggering subject for a, a poem. And then there's like, at some point it wants to turn toward its real subject. And I think sometimes when you're in that turn, you haven't made it yet, those are the hardest parts of writing something. Your book's about to become what it wants to become, and you're in what the book has been to you. And this might happen many times in a book, as it does to me. And I think that's a place where confidence gets screwy, and you just have to sort of stay in it. So, I hope that's helpful. Hi. <laughs> um, since we have the paragraph boys on stage, uh, I have a question about paragraphs. If, if they don't have arcs, um, I'd be interested to hear both of you talk about what ways you do conceptualize the paragraph as a unit of writing. Is there a movement in it, or is there like uh, three different kinds of paragraph, or I don't know how, how you think. Yeah. What's your, what's your paragraph take? Um. <laughs> I mean, my paragraph take is basically that I think that a paragraph should have a subject. Yeah. A, 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 this is her paragraph, right. this is his paragraph. Um, that if there's a sudden shift from one subject to another, it's like, let's put a paragraph break yeah. in there. Um, and then uh, otherwise it just sort of needs to get coherently from the beginning yeah. to the end, whatever that might mean. Um, and, 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 and it has to be its own sort of unit. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of remember teaching like composition when I was a grad student being like, oh, this thesis statement stuff is useful for fiction writers too, right? Like the paragraphs really do have that. Um, I mean, I think a lot about uh, paragraph variety and the way I think about sentence variety, that a lot of what seems to be style is like uh, the different kinds of paragraphs and the different kinds of sentences you're writing, the way you move between them is part of it. Um, I'm thinking a little bit about something I think Laura Vandenberg talked about one time where she's talking about like where you put things in a paragraph and that you know obviously anything at the beginning of the paragraph gets a lot of emphasis that's like the thesis statement of the paragraph right and the way you kick out of the paragraph uh, gets a lot of attention and says when you want to when you want to give the reader information but you don't want them to think too much about it you put it in the middle of the paragraph the like detail that's going to matter in the next chapter can often be casually like put in the middle of the paragraph so you don't like overemphasize it but the reader still gets it um, and I also think about uh, Gary L. Lutz writing about uh, long paragraphs being places you bury your bad prose. <laughs> um, and I think about that a lot in editing, where sometimes when you, know, like you have two paragraphs that have some bad sentences, you make them one big paragraph, and you're like, that works. <laughs> <laughs> and that gets you by for a little while. And then later you're like, I gotta face that bad paragraph. Um, so like, yeah, maybe trying to figure some of that out. That, none of that was like an answer, some of that, but like those are some of the things I'm thinking about. I really like a big blocky paragraph. I think you can get away with them more than you think you can. Yeah. But they are like hiding places for secrets and bad prose. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to watch out for that. Yeah. yeah okay. oh, the best place to put a bad sentence is the middle of a half page paragraph, for I sure. That. Yes. <laughs> Hi. 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 I'm uh, um, sort of two. One, this may be more for Benjamin, if you perceived a difference between um, when people couldn't cut and paste, when things were tight, <laughs> and, you know, and you just literally could not do what we can do so easily now. And um, just curious for your thoughts on that. And then the, actually this would be a, sort of a related question, which is not everyone stays with the same publisher, this has been my experience, right. and or the same copy editor. And I wonder what your thoughts are 
how ride, a writer might ride that out or not <laughs> when that right. happens. I mean, I can certainly say to the, to, to, to the, to, to the first idea that you had, um, for me, observing and participating in that transition from writers write on, on, on typewriters and then we Xerox things and then they retype and they retype, heading into uh, working on books that had clearly gone through the word processing process. And then even more, I mean, I, I resisted, as, 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 as copy chief, as the head of my department, I resisted electronic copy editing for as long as mm. I possibly could. Because I really thought that like e-copy editing was going to be the downfall of good copy editing. Mm. Uh, I thought everybody's going to get sloppy. Everybody's just going to be sort of gliding past things. You're going to lose that wonderful interaction of pencil to paper. All of that was, of course, completely idiotic. I was wrong. <laughs> um, don't ever, don't ever blame the tools for the job. Mm. Um, mm. I do not miss copy editing with a pencil for anything. Yeah. Um, it, it, Everything, everything changes, everything shifts, but I, I, I think that writers have embraced the kind of work that they can do writing on their computers and copy editors embrace the kind of work mm -hmm. they can do doing that work on the computers in, in ways that has actually worked out just quite brilliantly. And I think that the, as, 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 as I like to say, I think that the quality of writing lately is just perilously high. Mm. Um, I, I just think writers mm -hmm. are just writing really well. Yeah. Um, uh, as, 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 to the, as to the other issue, I, I know that like going from house to house is, it can be very traumatic uh, for, for, for yeah. writers. I, I have heard all of the horror stories about um, writers whose editors have left, but oh, the manuscript yeah. stays where it was, and the person they're assigned to isn't terribly interested in them. I mean, one of the things, at least I can say, that I've observed firsthand uh, at Random House is that sometimes editors do leave. Oh, right, my editor left halfway through the process oh, yeah. uh, to go someplace else. And, and I was given over to a new editor who took brilliant care of me. Um, and, and I've seen that over and over again in our house, that, that on those occasions when authors have to be reassigned, the people who, who take, over their, take over their work are, are, are so invested. Mm, that's so, great. Uh, you know, I can only speak, I can only speak to, to my house. Yeah. I'll say really briefly, I know we have another question, but I think um, there's always a thing of like getting to know a new editor, which is real. It's like you sort of like, you, you have your shorthand with other people, you have the ways you work with them, and, um, but I think uh, that seems solvable, like working with new editors has mostly been good for me. Um, and sometimes they light up parts of your process the other person didn't notice or, or they bring something else to it. And, and, uh, and everybody has the things they focus on and don't focus on editorially. So hopefully, ideally, if you had more than experiences, you would be getting the more voices in your head that help you make the book good, you know? As long as it's not like destroying your confidence to be in a new place every time, which I think is a, is a different question than just the actual editorial yeah. sort of process, yeah. And we have time for one more question from our in-person audience, and then we're gonna ask a couple of questions from our Zoom right. audience. So much pressure on you. <laughs> like, um. <laughs> um, so I have a question about part of the process, I guess, between the really rough exploratory draft and the more sentence level yeah. detail oriented one. I'm in the second draft of a novel right now and thinking a lot about what you were saying earlier about tunneling into backstory. Yeah. So how do you figure out and what does this look like for you? How much backstory there should be, how much contextualizing there should be and, and when you should cut? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, I will say, uh, I think I've never complained about a novel and been like, I wish there was more backstory in this. So that's, that's like answer one, which is glib and true. Um, the other part of it, I, I think, is one of the things I, I do really, uh, somewhere in the process, I go through, I actually go through like a highlighter, and I highlight all the backstory, and I also highlight all the explanation, which, is, which sometimes are the same thing, but sometimes they're different. A place where like I'm explaining what's happening to the reader. And, and backstory can be a version of that. And what I'm, what I'm really trying to do is, is identify the scaffolding of the book. That explanation is like, as, as we're people who are writers because we think by writing. And so one of the things you're doing sometimes when you're writing is 
telling yourself what the book means as you're writing it in prose. And, it, and it, uh, like, especially around like dialogue sometimes, there's like someone will say something in the prose will be like, well, this is what I really meant by that, you're right? And it's like, but that's you figuring it out. And one of the things that happens is you write that in the best possible prose you can, and then you edit it, and you work on it, and you make it good, and it kind of calcifies in place. And that's the stuff that I'm usually trying to get out a little bit. If the book is working, the book already does that. And I think that that kind of backstory and that kind of explanation is, is your experience of the book you wrote. And when you pull it out, you make room for the experience of the reader. And so like, I, I think like, the reader does not want your logic. They want their own logic. They want to make sense of the things themselves. And when they have their own interpretation of the book, they feel those, and it becomes personal to them. And when they have your interpretation of the events, they, um, they agree or disagree. But they don't, they don't make it them, their own. So I think that's, that's like a big part of that, if you can get, out of your, 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 get that out of the way. Um, it's, the, it's the iceberg theory stuff, right? Like that's, you're making the iceberg there. And when you take it out, the reader's left with what's, what's the actual tip of it that you want them to, to be with. Um, and then maybe the other last thing about backstory is like, uh, it took me a long time to understand this, I think, but backstory that like complicates the character does tons of work, and backstory that explains the character should, should go um, almost all the time. If you can make that determination about which of the two things the backstory is doing, I think you, you go a long way toward making those choices. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So this question is from Theodore uh, to both of you. What in your mind is the most important difference between revising a draft before anyone else sees it and revising a draft in collaboration with an editor or agent? Do you notice a difference between revising a manuscript after a sale versus before? Mm. That's a great question. I, uh, I would say I wait a really long time before I show anybody anything. Um, my, my novel, Appleseed, I worked on for three and a half years before I showed anyone a page of it. Um, I, about a year in, I always send my agent an email, and I'm like, this is what I'm up to. And he writes me back, we'll make it work. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's fine, <laughs> which feels reasonably OK. Um, so I, I do, a, I mean, really, like everything that's in this book, this is like my process up to the point where I show it to someone. So, so it, it does go a long way. I'm so grateful for the collaboration by the time I get there. I think my goal is really to turn in the book like as far as I could possibly take it on my own. And so I'm really happy to then have other people in it. And it is, it is messy, because you have your own conception about things, and, and there are always things your editor doesn't like or doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, I'm trying to use the, not use the phrase doesn't understand. They understand. They just don't agree, <laughs> which is a different problem. Um, and you're, you're sort of working through that. But I, I mostly find it really delightful, I think, um, because I've gone through the process so far on my own first, um, it's a real joy to finally feel people talking back to me about the book and talking about the characters and talking about the story beats and talking about how it all works. Um, so by that phase, I'm usually pretty good. Um, I, I remember feeling when my first novel came out and, and we're with you know, Mark who edited this book, being like, well, you ideal editor is someone who loves, 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 like 90% of what you do and thinks the other 10% is real bad and, uh, and will help you get rid of that 10%. Um, and I think I've been lucky to have editors who have, who have approached my books from like, I mean, maybe they're like 70, 30, but like, you know, like some proportion of that, where like what they love, they love, and so you should trust them on what's not working. Yeah. yeah. I mean, with the book that I with the book that I wrote, I mean, it was such a, it was such a grab bag of bits and pieces. I mean, I started, I wrote all the easy stuff first, all the <laughs> all the listy chapters, um, and then and then had to write the sort of this tougher stuff. So I was sharing it in in bits and pieces and getting feedback in bits and pieces. But at a certain point, when it was really time for it, from my perspective, to go all the way from the beginning to the end, it's like I needed to sort of like, all right, everybody stay out of my way. Yeah. Um, you know, the book that I'm the book that I'm working on right now, which is. I mean, as as you were as 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 you were saying, that first draft is about discovering what the uh -huh. book is. Yeah. It's like all of the ideas that I had about what I'm doing are constantly rethinking themselves as I am reading the material that I want to write about and taking the notes. It's like, oh, I hadn't thought of that before. Yeah. And, and, and an endless stream of I hadn't thought of that before <laughs> is so much fun. Yes, yeah. Um, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. That's the game, right? Yeah. 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 Here's a question from Denise. 
Is there a statute of limitations on how long a draft can languish in your hard drive before you pick it up again? Asking if I should abandon my NaNoWriMo completed book from five years ago. Oh, yeah. I mean, five years isn't a long time to work on a novel. I mean, it's a long time to work on a novel, but it's also not, right? Like, books get written that time all the time. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. I mean, it's, I mean, so one of the things that's really interesting to me about novel writing is the way that you become a new person over the time of writing the book, because it just takes a certain amount of time. Um, and I think the thing I find really pleasing is that um, the person you are every day you're writing a novel is a different person. So you sit down, you had a different experience the day before, the weather's different, different things are happening in your own cultural backdrop. Um, you know, uh, the news is different every day. Uh, you have different interactions with your family and your friends. And so the, a different person approaches that book every time. Um, so the person who re-picks your book up five years after uh, you worked on it is a different person. And if, if your past person and your present person can collaborate, then that's a book that can go. And if they can't, they can't. I mean, I, I, I definitely could see that like some of the things I was thinking about five years ago, I'm not interested in thinking about anymore. So that's different. Um, but if you pick up a book and it feels vital to you or the person you are now has a new way into that material, I don't see any reason why you couldn't be writing that book. Um, I think people have very, very long careers. There's frequently books that get picked up that were like partially written 10 years ago when they were 40 and get finished when they were 50 or something. You know, I think that's not actually that rare. Um, it maybe feels rare when it's a first book in certain ways, but it's, it doesn't mean it is. It just feels different because you don't have other things. In the, often in the same way, but I, I don't know. I think the idea that two different versions of yourself might write this book together um, is potentially wonderful. Yeah. But hard to know, for sure. Yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, I, I, I often think about the idea that it's like, it's like there, there could be in the universe 50,000 different versions of this one book, oh, depending yeah, upon, absolutely. like, did you start at 8.05 or at 8.07? Yeah. Yeah. And of course, I remember, like, you know, when I, was, when I was eight and I learned the concept of infinity, and it was like nightmare city. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just picture you, like, a small version of you upset all night about infinity. Exactly, it's nice. Know, <laughs> yeah. But it's like, it's, it's, it's I mean, you are, you're just doing your best to write yeah. things that are true. Yeah. And true in the moment and possibly true forever. But I think if you can lock down in the moment, then forever will take care yeah. of itself. Yeah, that's good advice. Yeah. And our final question from Leslie is, what is the toughest thing you've had to learn about the revision process? Oh. That's not done yet. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's, we all have different things that we're good at or bad at. And so some of it's like figuring out what's hard for you, you know? Um, I think one of the things I like about novel writing is it puts you in touch with your, your lacks really quickly. Um, that doesn't sound like a nice thing. Uh, but I, I, I see it in my students too. Like, and it's not, and this is no way to say like short story writing is hard. Short story writing is the hardest thing. But like, um, as, as the book gets bigger, the things you can't do yet become really apparent. And you, and you sort of have to constantly be facing them or you quit. And so there's, all, there's a point where you've written 300 pages and there's something wrong with all of them, you know? And you're sort of like, how will you ever address this? Um, <laughs> um, that doesn't sound encouraging. I'm going to get to the encouraging part. Um, but I, I, I do think like the number goes down as you work and you find your way through it. And, there, and it is a bit of like facing yourself. And every book fails partly. That's why you have to write another one. Um, I think uh, if you could write one perfect novel, you'd probably stop. Like, that'd be good. Um, I, I seem to keep writing them, so I haven't done that yet. Um, and I, I think there's something that happens two-thirds of the way through every book process where I go, this is the thing this book won't be able to do, or this is the thing the book is not capable of. And then you have to edit the rest of the book knowing it's not going to do this other thing you care about. Um, and that, some of that's the fuel for the next book. I always feel like every novel starts out, it's like, it's about these 10 things. And after a draft, I'm like, it's about these five things. And then literally, I'm like, it's about these three things. And at the end, I'm like, did I do this one well? Um, <laughs> but that's part of the reason to write again. But I think, I don't know, like being in touch with what you can't do, or can't do yet, can't do yet, is really the thing, um, is part of the process. And I know every novel's goals have come out somewhat out of the things I couldn't do in the last one, where I'm like, I'm going to learn to do this this time. Or I'm going to do this. Um, I think a lot about seeing Ann Carson like 15 years ago give a talk in Ann Arbor in Michigan and someone asked uh, Carson like, why have you written so many different kinds of books? And she's like, 
you, you set out to write a book, you learn to write the book. Once you've learned to write the book, you learn to write another book. And I was like, write. That's the job. <laughs> That's what I want to do. I want to learn to write a lot of different kinds of books. Um, so you, if, you, if you write like that, you will always be in touch with what you can't do until you can do it. And, um, and that, the fact that you can learn to do those things seems very, very exciting to me. I have nothing to add. <laughs> no, the only thing I have to add, like this, so this is how I make my way to the exit yeah. door, which is to say that, I mean, it's like I have, I have read Matt as a writer of fiction and mm. taken great joy in, in it, because he's, 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 he's a lovely writer. But this book, I mean, it's like when when my time comes, it's like I will have that I will have the book handy because as a teacher, I, it's just superb. It's just superb. So congratulations. Thank you so much, Ben. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.